So thank you very much for inviting us. Um, uh, it's our first week of primary school uh, this week. Um, and it's, we would like to really just share some of the things that we try and enable for our big people and our little people um, in our school. Um, frame, framing this whole context is, is there, are three, there seem to be three existential uncertainties that, that we're all uh, managing. The one to planet Earth, you know, will we exist? And children very much are, are, are tuned into that. The second is as communities feel more fractured, we feel it in the playground, in the, in the, in the community, things more fractured. And the third is a sense of an insecurity about uh, self-purpose, you know, um, and we, we hear from children some of the things that they're worried about. So within that context, and also the, you know, the, the Ch Children's Commissioner, who, who, who's quoted recently that saying that play is important to me in schools, which is a, an important re revelation for her to have come to. Um, and at least she's acknowledged, acknowledged it now. That 20% um, so of, of young people are suffering from mental health um, concerns and, and poor health. So, uh, short... How, where do I click? I think, do I click? Ah. There we go. So I was Thank fortunate you. to go to, um, to to go to Switzerland in, in my holiday, and I met a lovely family and this little boy here who who seemed to smell the pheromone, pher, 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 pheromones of uh, teacher, and so just stuck to me, um, and so I baby, babysat for this week with this child, and um, uh, he's awesome. I like the T-shirt says be awesome, but we were actually avoiding all the lava that was flowing down this bridge and flowing down the hills. And then we, we couldn't speak, he couldn't, I, he couldn't speak English, I couldn't speak German. Um, and so we spent the whole day trying to work out how we were playing. And we were, he, it was fascinating to watch him completely in his world and him allowing me to enter that world. And, you know, the lava story kind of evolved into that. And, and Amy also had a, a, a week. A holiday. very interesting holiday, but I've got two children, one's almost 25 and 21. I still class them as children. I've got very young nieces and nephews, so I'm always palming my children onto them. They say, can we play? I'm saying, go off with them, have a lovely time, I'll relax. Because in school, with a curriculum that supports play, I spend most of my week playing, so I was having a bit of a break from that this yeah. summer. So um, from this experience, I, we started thinking about this is uh, an image that that boy uh, screenshot on my phone that he took off me at some point during this uh, engagement of play. Um, and he took this picture uh, of what he found. Um, so it, it got me thinking, actually. Um, he's kind of helped create this presentation. What is, the, what is happening in the space between him and his imagination with these, whatever's going on here? And what's going on for the adult in this space? So as an educator, parent, and, and child, and then what's going on between us? What's the space? In our school, we talk about spaces, spaces quite a lot. We try to create a space. We have spaces of uncertainty that, en that enable um, adults and, and teachers to enter spaces that are as stranger, so that we never, we never assume that we know what we're doing. Um, and our school, which I'll introduce you in a minute, was, in, was principled on some of the Cambridge Primary Review. Yeah, so we thought, what is the purpose of education and what is the purpose of play and how do we bring the two together and what do they mean for us as adults and for the children within our school? And we'll go on and look at the curriculum in a moment and you'll see how it features in our school. And for me as an educator coming from a different primary school to the University of Cambridge with all of the research that underpins it, it's been very interesting and I'll talk about my journey and the journey of a particular child in a moment. So what are schools for? What's the purpose of, of education, primary education? What's the purpose of play in primary education? Um, so the University of Cambridge um, decided to build a big development on the northwest of Cambridge, called, now called Eddington. And as part of that planning, there was a requirement to build a 1.4, sorry, a 2.4 entry primary school. We discovered that 0.4 of a class doesn't really work for teachers, so we made it a, a three form entry school. Um, sorry, it's going. Um, so it's the first, it opened in 2015. It's the first primary university training school in the country. We're completely state funded and don't get any money from the university, um, though I do ask quite a lot, but, but uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll move on from that. Um, and the idea was to develop research-informed practice to bring the knowledge, you know, often academic research is reified as the knowledge and teachers have to then try and work out how to make it into their practice. We said there's practitioner wisdom and there's act ac academic research and knowledge. How do these come hand in hand and support one another in enabling the very best action and, 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 and uh, enabling what goes on in classrooms? 
Um, we serve a very di diverse community, about 40% speak English as additional language, and we have a, a view that we want to connect with as many people who are interested to, to play with us and to work with us. So as part of that, the, the, our, as you know, a curriculum is the heartbeat of any school. And so our curriculum design, we decided the heart of what we're trying to do is nurture compassionate citizenship. And um, there are three parts to that. There's the self, there's a how you engage in your community, and then how the community engages with a wider, uh, a wider world. And then if you look at, uh, you know, Siobhan was talking about the spaces that we create and the relationships. That purple hexagon look, talks about the interaction between space um, and relationships. And through those values, then create the ethos in which people want to try new things, the adults want to try new things, enable some playfulness in their classrooms. And then we, the yellow hexagon is really about uh, capturing how we, how we um, coordinate the different subject areas. The green is about acknowledging there are different kinds of knowledge, There's disciplinary knowledge, interdisciplinary knowledge, and transdisciplinary knowledge, and we have uh, some thinking about that and then ways of being, ways of thinking, and then ways of enacting. But then what joins them all together is habits of mind. We know there's a robust uh, evidence of um, work about habits of mind and self-regulation. Oracy and dialogue, the work of Neil, of Neil Mercer and Rupert Wegriff and others, talked about the importance of oracy and dialogue in schools. And then I think, I haven't seen it anywhere else, but uniquely putting playful inquiry, because we had the relationship with the Pedal Centre, Playful inquiry as an important thread that binds us together. How do we enable these three things um, to happen within a classroom that is, a, is already a saturated curriculum um, in a context where Ofsted doesn't really go for this kind of thing? And be brave to do it, to release our imagination and design opportunities that are playful for our young people and our big people. Yeah, so coming in as an educator with playful inquiry what does that mean? What does it mean for me and the children? So James, through his wonderful leadership, has um, created some wonderful, playful moments for the adults in the school. So we've had new possibilities of thinking in different ways and an experience in play. Because as an educator at a previous school, the children did playtime. They went out and played. They came in and did the academic learning. Never once was play ever mentioned. So here, we had moments of playfulness as adults on inset days. I've been Oliver Twist in a workhouse. I've been a fairy skipping around the playground, which you'll see um, soon. Recently, we learned about the firebird firebird story in a playful way. I was a dancing maiden, and so. For adults, some adults who come to our school and haven't experienced, it's really uncomfortable because they played as a child, they don't play as adults. And in a way, how can you ask me to do this? I haven't done it for so long. So to reconnect with your inner child is really powerful because you begin to experience what children will in the classroom when they're asked to do something. And so you begin to consider as adults, how do we scaffold the learning? How do we make it playful so there is delight, wonder and joy and all those things? And to consider their emotions and how will they feel? And again, to, dis um, to consider differences in play because every child plays differently. So how do we consider everyone and make sure they're included? Because um, our school is so diverse and the children come from very different, uh, different experiences of childhood. Uh, we realise that not all children know what play is. They haven't been allowed to play for so long. So what does a school do to, to enable that to happen? And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. So um, from that curriculum design, we have a, our policy then talks about children who have the control of their environment, a responsibility to posi posi positively in, uh, manage setbacks and challenges, children who set their own tasks with no particular end in mind, spontaneously set themselves challenges, and encourage positive attitudes to learning. Some of the things that are in our policy, building on the research informed practice, so it's not just because the head teacher likes dancing around and likes singing, um, but um, there's something much more profound than that. So because we can't take you to our school on this lovely sunny day, we've brought the school to you. This is some of the, um, some of the things we get up to um, during our years. Here I am. 
So lots of adults modelling to children to be playful. Admin team, as well as the learning, the teaching assistants, everyone in the community is involved in play. Using movement, as Siobhan said, getting you out of your head and into your body. We have five values in our school of empathy, respect, trust, courage, and gratitude that form the, the kind of the DNA of how we want to engage. So we have Jane Weaver here working with us. We sing every morning. The children come into school, they sing, and then they do a meditation circle, and then the day starts. One, they are doing some drama and also some writing. We engage with artists to come and help us play even better, and dancers. And this is an art project the children uh, conceived to try and um, explore issues of climate change and the things they were worried about, and creating an installation of boxes like this. So, um, hang on, just, I've, I've skipped one, sorry. So, um, here's some other, just uh, quick little snapshots, just because we listen to our uh, family album. Um, is, uh, you know, that's my dad's three-piece white suit with flares from the, from the 70s, the original one. So it's, um, but children, we had a big, I said one day we want a carnival. And so the teachers said, how would we do a carnival with 700 children? But we just made it happen. There's a kind of sense of, let's just, if it, it might be possible, let's just go for it. Um, and children wanted to come and paint my beard because it was part of the carnival season. So reception children bought the glitter and the paint and then decided that they needed to decorate me. Um, but, you know, these little moments of playfulness, this is a, a trip we went for an Erasmus project in the bottom left where we spent, Amy and I are quite playful and we just spent a lot of time laughing to the, shag, to the embarrassment of our colleagues. Um, yeah. But yeah. we're just kind of modelling that, you know, the head teacher can be playful, the senior members of the team can be playful and it's important. But you know we're working in a, in a context that's very accountability, accountability heavy. Um, I'm, work, I'm writing a chapter in a book about play uh, that will be published in in, um, in January, that uh, with Neil Gilbride, and we talked about these notion of wicked problems. That schools are complex systems. Um, that are, they're complex. They're evolving. They're, they have loosely linked systems. Um, there is no real system in a school. We kind of make it up as we go along because we have to r respond to the challenges that are sometimes very unique in a school context. Um, they, Rittle and Weber call them wicked problems. Um, they're disruptive. They kind of cause people to feel uncertain. But a leader's role and the, the leadership team that we have in our school enables both the uncomfortable and the safe to coexist. And that's important if you want to get in that kind of sweet spot of being playful. Um, now the problem with wicked problems is um, there's no solution, there's no correct solution, and head teachers love order and don't like chaos. So we like to have everything organised, everyone in lines, um, typically. And um, so the, there's no correct solution to these, some of these wicked problems. The second um, problem with a problem is um, they're unique often, um, and the problems are unpredictable, and you can't compare the outcome with another kind of problem. And finally. Um, you can't test the solution because it's a wicked problem. You can't really work out whether it would work. So the biggest wicked problem we've had recently, as we all probably share, is the locking down of schools. That was our big wicked problem. So we thought, what do our children need as they return from lockdown? And some of them still need this approach today. So we looked to the work of Barry Carpenter, who... Um, talked about five different um, issues that children would suffer from lockdown and one of them was the loss of structure, the other one was the loss of routines and just the basic school day but mostly they felt like they were locked in a prison and unable to access their friends, friendship and play. So when they returned, instead of following the government narrative of catch up, classroom, reading maths and whatever it is, English, that's the other one, we would go, 
for a full-on play approach and attend to the whole child. Every year, as a matter of routine, we contact every um, family, class teachers do, phone to check in how the summer was, what does the child need, are there any issues, can we help in, a way, in any way? Because for some children, they go home, they're an only child, they might not have many play dates because mum's working, they've got someone else helping them at home. So some children come back, they need play more than anything. For some of our children, they came back huge mental health worries, not only about lockdown, but about their families, would they contract COVID and die? So we had to nurture each individual child. It sounds a lot when we talk about 700 children, but when your school is based on relationships and what each individual child, we looked at these four different areas. Of course, children need academic progress, but they can only access that if they're feeling well. So we looked at physical health, we employed Premier Sports to come and work every day with us. Every class had um, daily PE, they also had extra play times, we did a lot of community making, discos, other events outside in school, and just made sure we nurtured every individual child. It was quite a feat and it has been relentless, but when you think about what school is, the purpose of education and the purpose of play, is to make sure that children are well, mentally, physically, and that they feel like they belong within their community. Because for some children who struggle with friendships, they have no play. And you often see them wandering around the outskirts of the playground, avoiding contact with others. So we've sort of, and I know Dan is here, a member of our team, so we'll go back and share the messages from today. She's been here relentlessly taking notes. So we'll deliver that to our team because it's those children who wander around the outskirts that we need to make, bring in and make sure they're included. Yeah, so while the government's so worried about, as we are, about attendance, attendance as being so low, um, and they want to invite head teachers to, to have more, to find people more, um, and to be more robust about our processes. You know, really, if you want, you know, and our, our attendance is typically over 95%, which compared with the, the national averages is, is, is very good. But if you want children to come to school, the relation, they want to like people in there, the relationship with the adults, and then the, the curriculum offer has to be so exciting, it's better than being at home. So the, we, we kind of, that's what we do. We just kind of show them, I say, to, I say to my team, make sure they know that you love them and then make sure that what you're doing with them is so exciting um, and not just jazz hands and um, kind of, um, you know, lots of singing and dancing, all that kind of stuff. You know, it can be rout routine, but it's kind of built on relationships, but it's, it's exciting to be there. And I think we understand that play is that foundational le level or layer for learning, academic learning. And if you've got all of that in place and they're able to go out to play, play happily or when we have playful inquiry in our learning streets and they're involved, then they will learn in class and come in and everything's there in place. So we welcomed um, one, one young person to our school a few years ago. Um, and we're going to just end with, with a, a snapshot of his story. We've, we've, we've kind of collated lots of other stories in it so that, that it's going to be more anonymised. Um, when, when he did come, the local authority said we just have, he was about two and a half years behind, academically behind his peers. So in year three, he was more like reception, just year one. Um, and we were told he has to just go, he has to learn how to read and, and do maths. That's what we had to focus on. Um, and we said we're not doing it. Um, and we this, did. this is what we did instead. Because their first, well, the first response day he came to was, us, yeah. they got on the phone to us and said, he needs a tutor, we'll send a tutor in for an hour a day to catch him up. And we basically said, well, he can't even stay in class for five minutes a day, so how you're going to do that for an hour is just beyond us. So we said, it's not happening. So myself and James um, welcomed him to our school, into James's office, and initially he just sat on the windowsill and wouldn't even engage with us. But we had a big block of clay. We had actually planned a huge table like of, this, of yeah. clay and wonderful things, um, and he came in and sat on the shelf, and so we played. Yeah. We, we, we made, we made a lovely whale with a big mouth. <laughs> he yeah. just watched and the whole time thinking, how can I leave this room because I don't feel particularly safe. safe. Yeah. So we just chatted, he ignored us, we carried on playing. And every day he came in, life was tough for him and he was so stressed. 
And partly, looking back on it now, we should have never have introduced him to the class so early. But until you've met a child, and especially after the COVID period, you don't know what they're like. Through, so through careful listening and observation, we agreed that this child was not ready for the classroom. So a battle with social workers, other professionals, we said, we are going to have a whole year of play and we will try and build up the classroom time, but if it doesn't work, it doesn't work, fine. He is gonna play, enjoy life again, and absolutely love himself, and then he'll be able to ac so access I, the classroom. I spent an afternoon, because his teaching assistant wasn't there one afternoon, I spent an afternoon with him in nursery, which was his favorite place to be, and we played mummies and daddies and shop, and I mean, it was the longest afternoon of my life, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Knowing that the hundreds of emails were kind of like, this is really, <laughs> yeah. really, really, really enjoying this. And then, should we go and play outside? No. We have to. Yeah. Um, but that, he, we re recognised he didn't have any of that. So he had missed out on zero to two. Because we assume children come to schools with play skills and they'll be able to just come in and play with friends, play in the classroom, access learning. And then it's not until you start to read about play deprivation and um, how they're just basically left, and they have zero skills. So there's a little park next to the school. So we started to take him to weekly visits to the play park. His learning coach at the time, teaching assistant, had to show him how to climb on the climbing frame. All those bits, we'd take him to Sainsbury's for a treat. School boy in the bike, we'd take him out on bike rides and things we like that, and just slowly build it up. We took him on the residential and made him climb the, the Jacob, the... Um, Jacob's ladder, the, the, the it is. the other thing that you slide down. Oh, yes, the zip yes. Line, the zip, zip line. line. And because no one had really said, no one had said, you've got to do this stuff. You know, you know no one had, I'm not saying push children in the water, but, you know, yeah. um, <laughs> no one had said, this is what you do. They said you get wet. So on the raft that they had to build, he didn't want to do it, but we, we had to model the courage you have to do. Yeah. So really, with, the, with this child and how we want to engage and with all our young people in our school, is to really listen to them um, and spend time. And I know schools are very busy places, but we, we, we want to foster this in our school, to watch, to step back and watch what goes on and not assume, and then attend to the need. So don't just do English and maths, we've decided, mm -hmm. but go back to what's needed. Because now, the accelerated progress of that child academically is immense. There's no, inter there's, there's no need for me to get involved in behaviour management anymore. It's and I'll just say, we were exhausted because he yeah. was exhausting us because he was more like a toddler. So we start to slowly introduce friends and phone parents. Can they go to the park during the school day? Parents are like, what? Because remembering back to their own schooling, you don't go to the park during the school day. So we made sure we phoned some parents. They were like, of course you can. Off we went. And so he's built really strong friendships. And so just to end our short presentation, um, we really want to think as a, as a school community about future making possibilities and that play is a key part, a key element of that um, opportunity to en enable every young person and in fact every adult as well in our school to be playful, to be as Maxine Green says, who's a philosopher, uh, Maxine Green talks about being a stranger in your practice, to step into your classroom as a stranger and to then to step back and see what's going on. And another phrase she uses is to release the imagination. Our strapline of our school is release the imagination, celebrate the art of the possible. And we, we strive to do that every day. Um, we make many, many mistakes, but that's part of the wicked problems of working with lots of people. Thank you very much for listening to us.